Zen is a form of Buddhism that developed in 7th and 8th century China when Buddhism spread from India to China and interacted with the indigenous tradition of Taoism. The word Zen reflects this. It is the Japanese way of pronouncing the Chinese character Chan, which itself derives from the Indian Buddhist term Jhana. Jhana means meditation, so Chan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism literally means a particular type of Buddhism that emphasizes meditation. Zen thrived in China during the Tang and Song dynasties, and eventually it spread to Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. In the 1960s and 1970s, it became very popular outside Asia, and today it is practiced around the world. If Zen is a form of Buddhism, does that mean Zen is a religion? As in Buddhism generally, Zen teachings do not mention God, sin, or how the world was created. Unlike most other types of Buddhism, Zen also says very little about karma or rebirth or what happens to us after we die. When the Japanese Zen master Hakuin was asked, what happens to a Zen master after he dies? He responded, why ask me? But you are a Zen master. Yes, but not a dead one. In Zen, there is little emphasis on rites and rituals, and no distinction between the sacred and the profane. In fact, Zen sometimes seems anti-religious. A common Zen saying is, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. A Zen monk once burned a wooden Buddha statue to keep himself warm, and he's been praised for it ever since. Is Zen a philosophy? Zen teachers do sometimes say interesting, if paradoxical, things about the nature of reality. But perhaps the most radical claim in Zen is that philosophy is not the way to realize the true nature of the world, including oneself. Philosophizing is usually part of the problem of life, not the solution, because our ways of thinking normally interfere with our perceptions. Instead, we should let go of our thoughts by meditating, which can help us open up to a non-conceptual and more direct way of experiencing the world. Some aspects of Zen practice are similar to what happens in psychotherapy. Zen meditation can make us more aware of deeply rooted patterns of thinking and acting. But the goal of Zen is not simply to cure neurosis and help us adjust better to the norms of everyday life. Zen training wants to provoke us into an experience that is precious and rare, enlightenment. Zen practice is not about solving the problems of the ego self, but realizing the sense in which there is no ego self. Nor do Zen masters indulge our inclination to talk indefinitely about our psychological hang-ups. Zen dialogues are short, sharp and to the point, with no concession to personal problems. So is Zen a type of mysticism? The term mysticism has strong negative connotations in the West, which has such a strong rationalist bias that alternative ways of experiencing are dismissed out of hand. The most damning criticism of something is to call it irrational. A better word to describe Zen experience is non-rational. If mysticism means a non-rational way of apprehending the world, then Zen might be considered a form of mysticism. There are, for example, profound similarities between Zen teachings and Christian mystics such as Meister Eckhart and Islamic Sufis such as Ibn Arabi. But if mysticism means transcending this world in order to experience some higher reality, then Zen is not mystical. The goal of Zen is not access to some other reality, but to realize the true nature of this reality, right here and now, undistorted by our projections and concepts about it. At its most profound, this experience is something matter-of-fact. When a monk named Zhao Zhou asked Zen master Nan Chuan what is the way, Nan Chuan replied, Ordinary mind is the way. Later, when a student asked Zhao Zhou to teach him, Zhao Zhou responded, 
Have you eaten your breakfast porridge? Yes, I have, replied the student. Then wash your bowls. The miracle of Zen adepts is that when they are hungry, they eat, and when they are weary, they sleep. Ironically, it is not easy to be so natural. It is the result of rigorous training. So, what is Zen? Perhaps the best definition is provided by D.T. Suzuki, the Japanese writer who did much to make Zen known to the West. Zen, in its essence, is the art of seeing into the nature of one's own being, and it points the way from bondage to freedom. Eihei Dogen, perhaps the greatest Japanese Zen master, summarized the Zen path in a very short and simple way. To study Buddhism is to study yourself. To study yourself is to forget yourself. To forget yourself is to realize your intimacy with all things. To study Buddhism is to study yourself because the point of Zen practice is not to master Buddhist teachings but to realize your own true nature, who you really are. And in order to realize who you really are, you must forget yourself, let go of yourself. Usually, our experience is dualistic. There is the sense of a me inside, perhaps behind the eyes or between the ears, that is conscious of a world outside. We normally take for granted this feeling of separation between myself and the external world that I am in. But it is a delusion. This sense of separation is not natural, but a psychological and social construct. Babies and very young children do not perceive the world that way, because it is the result of conditioning. As we learn to speak, we also learn to see and understand the world, including ourselves, in the ways that other people do. The conditioned self that develops is an interacting cluster of mostly habitual ways of thinking, feeling, acting, reacting, remembering, intending, and so forth. Because these are processes, not things, this sense of self tends to feel uncomfortable. It can never secure itself because there is nothing substantial there that could be secured. We usually experience this insecurity as a sense of lack, as the feeling that something is wrong with me, that I'm not good enough or that I'm missing something important. Unfortunately, we usually misunderstand what the real issue is and become preoccupied with trying to obtain the things that we think will fill up our sense of lack, money and material possessions, reputation or status, a more attractive body. But these are not enough to make us happy because our preoccupation with them is only a symptom of the deeper problem. To study yourself is to forget yourself, says Dogen. If the sense of a self that is separate from the world is a delusion, how can you forget it? By immersing yourself wholeheartedly in your meditation practice. When we meditate, we are letting go of those habitual ways of thinking, feeling and so forth that compose the sense of self. In this way, the constructed sense of self is deconstructed. Meditation does not cause enlightenment. As one contemporary teacher put it, enlightenment is always an accident, but meditation makes us accident prone. And when that accident happens, the sense of separation between the self and its world evaporates. Then, you realize your intimacy with all things, as Dogen wrote. He described his own experience by saying that, I came to realize clearly that mind is nothing other than rivers and mountains and the great wide earth, the sun and the moon and the stars. Perhaps Nisargadatta, a 20th century Indian teacher, expressed it best. When I look inside and see that I am nothing, that's wisdom. When I look outside and see that I am everything, that's love. Between these two, my life flows. Wisdom and love, or compassion, the two pillars of the Buddhist path. To realize that I am not separate from the world is wisdom. 
to live in the way that implies is love.